Hello again from Philadelphia. My name is Matthew Mitchell, and I'm from the Center for Evidence-Based Practice at the University of Pennsylvania Health System. If you want my contact information or a little bit more about our center, you can pause the recording right here and get all that information. We do this here to show you who SEP is, that we are a hospital-based HTA center serving uh, a network of uh, six hospitals and that our work is funded internally. We have no external conflicts. So our story begins in 2019 with the new respiratory disease that eventually became known as COVID-19. It reached the United States and spread around the world in early 2020. And Washington State and New York City were two of the uh, early hotspots and with our proximity to New York City, our caseload in Pennsylvania grew by a factor of 10 in just two weeks. This kind of growth and this kind of burden on our healthcare system put a lot of strain on our supplies, uh, especially N95 respirators and other personal protective equipment. Our hospitals were over capacity. We had critical, we had not enough critical care beds for the patients who needed them. And there was a clamor to get into our negative pressure rooms to have our patients uh, with, for our patients with COVID. This also stressed our staff in a number of different ways, not just the long work hours, but also concerns about infection of themselves or family uh, as a result of their work. So here's one example of the kind of strain that we were in that we have a triage facility that was set up outside of our hospital so that we could handle the patients who were coming in with suspected respiratory disease. This was a worldwide problem that the supply chain simply wasn't able to meet the need for personal protective equipment early in the early days of the pandemic. The guidance for frontline workers was to wear a mask whenever entering the rooms where patients were with suspected infection were present. And if doing an aerosol generating procedure, wear an N95 respirator. This is the higher level of protection uh, needed for uh, in, in, in procedures where there is a high risk of infection. And since nasopharyngeal swabbing, the COVID testing was considered an aerosol generating procedure, we had a lot of demand for those N95s. And any of the workers in contact with a suspected case should wear additional personal protective equipment besides the mask or the N95. So as a result, there was quite a bit of demand exceeding our supply, and not least of which because there was a lot of disagreement about who needed those, those uh, uh, N95 masks the most. So I want to show you a little dashboard that was produced by the Hospital Association of Pennsylvania. Uh, this was gave us a daily look at what the conditions were at the hospitals in our state. That we had the number of patients that we were treating, what our uh, what the trend was, how beds were being utilized. And I'm going to call out two parts of this. Uh, one speaking about the number of hospitals in Pennsylvania who were concerned about a shortage of personal care, personal protective equipment. Uh, at this point, 75% of the hospitals were concerned about that, with the point where even uh, 20, a fifth of the hospitals were at the point where they were had no more than a three-day supply of those N95s. And so with such duress affecting them, there really was no use but to reuse the personal protective equipment. So now the question we have is how do we best decontaminate that so it can be safely used again, even though they were made for a single use? There was no instructions from the manufacturer, not just because they were concerned about the effective reprocessing on the safety of their equipment, but also for legal reasons as well. So we have a novel HTA question in front of us. When all the guidelines say don't reuse the personal protective equipment and don't try to decontaminate it, we have no health technology assessment reports and no direct evidence from the kinds of sources we would normally be looking at. How do we answer the question when 
our providers and administrators can't wait to get better evidence before they make their decision about how to deal with this shortage. We think about the levels of evidence where evidence-based guidelines are at the top and expert opinion is down at the bottom. We have a pyramid. But in the early days of the pandemic, the decontamination question had very, very little evidence. And what evidence we had was at the very lowest levels, expert opinion and some individual case reports. So how do we do a health technology assessment report then if we don't have any kind of direct clinical evidence? The need to, we need to get this information out quickly, and we've got a very, very weak evidence base. And so what we did was to create a new evidence product specifically designed to capture that kind of low level evidence. Now I talk about this product in our other presentation. We call it a rapid guidance summary, and it is an adaptation of existing off the shelf guidance rather than a new search for evidence and an analysis of that evidence. We search a limited set of sources, a known set, what we could call a closed set, because we're not looking on an open-ended search through our databases. We summarize the findings, appraise the strength of the evidence, and the final result was about three to eight pages, so the report would be easy to read and easy to use. So here's what the initial product looked like which we issued on March 26th. There's a series of recommendations and a grading of the evidence that comes with each of those. Our findings were that the guidelines issued by the major public health organizations like CDC only extended to when the face masks and N95 should be used. There was no guidance from these organizations about how to, whether they should be used for an extended period of time or how they should be reprocessed. There was, however, one piece of guidance issued in 2018 from NIOSH, uh, the United States Occupational Safety and Health Administration. We also, since we were finding that other hospitals in the United States were in the same situation, they had policies that they shared with their employees uh, and made available for other hospitals to learn from. And we searched out a lot of these peer medical centers to get their instructions and put them into our initial reports. So our reports looked like this. And when you get past that center page, that front page, looking in, we have some guidelines from uh, major organizations, public health organizations, WHO, European CDC, etc. And each time we have a web link to the original source and a copy of the recommendation. So it's all summarized in one place. And then we did the same thing with the hospitals that we got information from. So this information here is from the University of Washington, which is one of the uh, hospitals that was very, very early in making their information about how to manage these patients and how to manage this situation available to the world. Now, since many of those health systems were follow, facing the same problems as we were, they developed their own decontamination processes. They used evidence that was direct and evidence that was indirect to try and develop the best process. We had previous information on uh, decontaminating products that had been uh, contaminated with other respiratory viruses. We had decontamination of surfaces. We had existing evidence on reprocessing of PPE and whether it would be safe for the materials and for the uh, integrity of the PPE itself. And one of the very positive things about this whole experience was that the investigators who were doing this work were very, very quick to share their findings with the world because they knew that lots of people were waiting to hear uh, and act on their evidence. Some of the evidence found that uh, we could rule out certain ineffective ways. So steam sterilization, we found, uh, according to the European CDC, was not a safe product for re reprocessing respirators. 
On the other hand, we had hospitals and medical centers that had methods that were promising, and they gave us pretty complex, complete details about how to do these. So this example comes from the University of Nebraska, which was where uh, a number of uh, material science people met with infection control people, and together they came up with solutions that could uh, decontaminate and their N95s for reuse. So with all of this information coming out, we had updated guidance and new information just a week later. And so we updated the report for the first time just nine days after we issued the initial report. We added a decision tree uh, for when to use any particular piece of uh, personal protective equipment. And since it was a nice big figure, we put it on its own page as an appendix to the report. Another thing that we did, which helped make the results more useful, was to compile a concordance table. A concordance table is a table where we take different components of a complicated intervention and a series of different guidelines and then identify which components are included in which guidelines and then making a space for noting any kind of differences between how one hospital does things and how other hospitals do things. This kind of information, this kind of uh, data presentation is very, very useful to our end users who want to get an idea of where there's general agreement and where there's not general agreement. Where there's agreement, we can put that question. We That one's answered. And where there's disagreement is where we want to focus our discussion and our search for new evidence. Two weeks later, we had another uh, evidence, another update. This one, because the topic was getting more and more complicated, we actually divided the report into two parts, one part on PPE use and one part on PPE reprocessing. By doing this, we could update them on their own schedules as increased evidence came out. We had new guidance from the CDC and our regulatory agency, FDA, gave emergency use authorization for use of existing hydrogen peroxide systems in decontamination of PPE. We kept searching professional societies and they reported that they had guidelines that were developed in development but not yet out. Uh, meanwhile, our health technology assessment partners like ECRI and CADETH were also on the case and issuing their first evidence reviews. And additionally, we had new ad hoc clearinghouses being put together by specialists in material science and infection control to try and consolidate the information on this particular topic. Here's one example of this. Uh, this was from a task force called N95 DECON. And you see a, a series of uh, planning papers and guidelines for the use and reprocessing of N95s. Meanwhile, in our own center, we had our we were developing a very, very useful catalog of sources. Every time we found another hospital that had a page of information on uh, managing patients with coronavirus or managing the reprocessing of devices or hospital administration in a time of pandemic, we put that into this catalog so that with a series of clicks, we could quickly update all of our reviews, look for latest information, check to see if any of these had been updated. And in fact, for some of these, we set up uh, automated web reminders, pay, uh, change trackers to email us when there was a new change to the guidance. So this led to following updates of our report. Uh, we, since we knew that the Infectious Disease Society of America was about to issue guidelines and they were a particularly important constituency, uh, we made sure as soon as we saw those, update, those guidelines being issued, we updated our report. And these updates typically took about one day of researcher time to review and to write. And then another day, not a full-time day, but just going through the review loops 
of having one or two clinicians go through our findings and make sure that we were presenting them in a clear way and that the findings were reasonable. So having our evidence catalog made this very, very easy because we didn't have to repeat a Medline search. We just went to that list of sources and looked for updates. The final update to our report came on June 1, which was just about two months after the initial uh, report. And by this time, the supply chain was providing enough N N95s that we were uh, needing to reprocess them a lot less. Hospitals had stood up their own particular reprocessing systems, uh, their systems for monitor providing these to the employees and getting them back to the employees. And since they were fully developed and in production, most of those hospital sources actually stopped updating their reports. And so we, when we saw that this was really a stabilizing evidence landscape, we were able to stop updating our reports. So our findings vis-a-vis -vis N95s was that there was no evidence on the clinical efficacy, in other words, in fact, of any method for decontamination of these respirators. The in vitro studies, which were indirect evidence, gave support to several technologies, including hydrogen peroxide and ultraviolet light. There was no evidence comparing the effectiveness of those different technologies and the guideline issuers didn't give us preference for one or the other. Some hospitals used one technology, some used another technology, but everybody agreed that these could potentially cause physical degradation of the N95 and cause it to not perform properly. And so everybody agreed that those must be checked for physical de degradation and fit. So to summarize things from an evidence-based practice standpoint, what we'd like to do here is always look for the best available evidence, regardless of what the state of the evidence base is, that sometimes when there isn't gold standard guidance out there, when there aren't high quality clinical trials, we're stuck relying on expert opinion. And so our job then is to consolidate that opinion, identify how it can be used to shape an informed decision. When time is short, use a limited closed set of sources and monitor those sources systematically so you know when things are updating. One lesson we learned from seeing the early guidance on use of respirators is that while there was a lot of consensus across hospitals about how to do things, everybody went back to the same guidelines from CDC as the ra rationale for their recommendations. And so while it looked like there was a wide, wide consensus, it really was one opinion that's very widely held, widely accepted. And so uh, we flagged that to say that uh, this was not as big a consensus, a broadest consensus as one might think. Uh, our concordance tables were very, very successful whenever a question is complex. And we urge you to use those not just in your rapid reviews, but any other reviews that you're doing on process of care. And obviously, when we have new evidence emerging, information is perishable, evidence is perishable, and so we have to be updating our reports frequently. So I uh, thank you for your time with this, and we thank all of the team that was involved with our rapid guidance summary project, uh, especially our medical students who volunteered to help us during the time of pandemic. Uh, our evidence team leader and co-author, Amelia Flores, our director, Nikhil Mull, and PJ Brennan, the chief of medical officer, who is our, uh, our boss and our uh, person who supports our work. So thank you, and we look forward to seeing you in the Netherlands in 2022.